Hey folks, I'm Chris and I'm your Commander Mechanic, here with another Let's Do a Brew podcast. But before we get started, I wanted to remind everybody that our Patreon is active. If you want to see more from us and you want to see more great guests on the show, go to patreon.com slash cmdrmechanic. There, you can help support us and you can help the channel grow. Getting into today's Do a Brew with today's special guest, Jim from the Spike Feeders. Jim, thank you for coming out today. Thanks for having me. Uh, you know, I'm sitting here safe and sound in the uh, Spike Feeder studio here in beautiful Winnipeg, Manitoba. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Th- thank you for taking the time to speak with us. Uh, we know that things are hectic in the Spike Feeder studio. Uh, congratulations on a successful Kickstarter. Thanks. That's actually what I got behind me. We just uh, picked up the boxes to ship out all these playmats. So. <laughs> amazing. A lot of happy people going to get those amazing War of the Spike playmats coming soon. Yeah, I'm I'm one of them, really. I can't wait for this plan to show up because I want one. <laughs> uh, that and that's going to be great. Is everybody at the table going to be using War of the Spike playmats? Yeah, we actually picked up a bunch of extras. We picked up four uh, to film with in the studio, and then we film. Or we picked up one uh, to frame and hang because nice. uh, we want that to be like you know number zero zero one. Um, and then uh, yeah, we each picked up one personally to to just play with when we bring to. Um, you know, our LGS or anything like that. Very nice. Very nice. Uh, but uh, I, I think that we got a little bit ahead of ourselves. Yeah. Uh, pe- people might know you best as Jim from the Spike Feeders, your fantastic gameplay channel on YouTube. Why, why don't you tell us a little bit about the Spike Feeders? Yeah, well, it's uh, it was kind of a side project that, you know, got out of hand. <laughs> we um, noticed that there was a little bit of a niche in uh, commander content uh, that was kind of underserved. So uh, essentially at the time when we started making content, it was basically just the Laboratory Maniacs or the Lab Maniacs. Mm-hmm. Um, that's Cameron and Dan and Cobblepot and all them. Mm-hmm. And uh, as well as Team Turn 3 uh, was kind of a brief flash in the pan doing recorded gameplay content. They're back now doing streaming content. But uh, they were really the only game in town when it came to you know higher power level commander gameplay. Right. So... We uh, took a look at that, and that's kind of the style that we played naturally in our play group. I would say about maybe half to two thirds of the time we played that higher power level. Uh, but uh, we noticed that there really wasn't anything out there. So we said, well, you know what? We can do this. It, it can't be that hard, right? Spoiler alert, it actually <laughs> is quite hard. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but we, uh, yeah, we picked up, uh, you know, a camcorder and I masking taped it to a hanging light fixture in my dining room and nice. we figured it out as we went. So amazing. Uh, yeah. And that, uh, over the past roughly year and a half, two years, uh, that's kind of snowballed into gameplay content, combo explanation videos. Uh, I'm starting up a podcast this week. Uh, it's going to be a video podcast. Nice. And, uh, you know, a whole boatload of other stuff. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. I, I know that you've, uh, you've recently moved from that kitchen dining room down into an actual studio, right? Yeah. To, uh, um, well, we moved twice. We were originally shooting in the dining room that if you go way back to season one, um, that was in our dining room. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, there was an office in the basement. We had a tenant in the basement and we kicked him out. <laughs> my, my girlfriend and I. And uh, we took over the office in the basement, uh, but it was too small. And so, um, you know, uh, I'm sure you've done a fair bit of work with uh, recording and setting up uh, spaces and small spaces don't sound good. Correct. So uh, we did basically everything we could with audio foam and everything like that. It just, it wasn't good enough. So uh, my girlfriend and I said, well, you know, why don't we renovate the basement? And uh, I said, well, you know, this could be some good studio space. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it took about three or four months and a lot of uh, drywall dust in my lungs but (laughs) we built a studio and here i am (laughs) very nice and we're going to see a lot of it in the new season on the channel is that right yeah we actually uh took um uh, quite a bit of a break we went from um we were going to be finishing our season in roughly december early january and then (laughs) you know, the world fell apart. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we ended up taking a break of about three or four months before we started recording again, because we wanted to play it safe. Mm-hmm. We didn't want to get together and record because we didn't want to, you know, be in the process of spreading anything that shouldn't be spread. So 
Uh, anyway, now we are back to recording. So uh, things are very, very safe. We're down to the last case uh, of COVID here in Manitoba. So we're ready to record. Uh, so this weekend, uh, it's going to be pretty much recording all weekend. We're recording a jumpstart tournament. We're recording um, some EDH gameplay. And uh, I'm looking forward to it. So, And I'm sure we're all looking forward to seeing it too. We've all been starved for that great Spike Feeders mm. content for a little bit. So it's great to have you back. Uh, now, I, I know on the channel, you're a little bit hesitant to call yourselves a CEDH channel. Is that right? Yeah, we actually uh, explicitly don't brand ourselves as CEDH. And uh, one of the reasons why we don't do that is, first of all, I think that it's a misnomer. I don't think that um, uh, I don't think that the word competitive accurately describes the style of gameplay that we're into. Um, when people think about competitive formats, they think about asocial formats. Mm -hmm. and, and when you hear uh, Sheldon and the Rules Committee talk about EDH not being a competitive format, that's mm -hmm. really what they're the core of what they're trying to get at, is that there are some undesirable traits of, of competitive gameplay. Mm -hmm. And that's competitive in any sport, in any sport, in any game. You know, uh, a pickup game of soccer, a beer league game of soccer is mm -hmm. different than a competitive game of soccer. Of course. You know, you're not there to share an experience with people. You're there to compete and your goal is to win. Right. So now, um, you know, we do have that same mentality of, you know, that should be the goal. But I do see a major social element in CDH gameplay that's not present in uh, something like competitive sports right. or even competitive magic. Right. So it's still it's still a beer and pretzels format. We're still you know screwing around in my basement, laughing and you know making fun of each other. Um, and that to me, it's not the it's not the World Series of Poker. You know, nobody's making the Pro Tour out of my basement. Right. <laughs> uh, and I, I think that that's a fantastic point. Uh, a lot of people hear CEDH, competitive EDH, and think that it is cutthroat and that it is every man for himself, everyone trying to win as quickly as possible. But you see your channel and a lot of the other CEDH gameplay channels, uh, CEDH TV, Play to Win, and you can see some real games that uh, have political aspects to them, where uh, unlike a competitive one-on-one -on -one tournament in Modern or Legacy, there's a real back and forth. And it's not a back and forth like in Casual, where it's, uh, don't attack me and I'll do this for you. It's I know that this person can win. If you do or don't do this, then we can prevent that person from winning. And it's just a different pivot on the uh, the political aspect of it than you'd see yeah. in a lower power game. Yeah, and you know, I uh, back when I used to write articles, I wrote an article about um, free information and signals. Yes. And about how that's one of the strongest political tools in your toolbox as, a, as an EDH player is selectively drawing attention to free information. Yes. Uh, and and uh, using it to tell a story of something that's not happening, right? I, that's what bluffing is, right? I, I I love that. That is my favorite aspect. Yeah, yeah. So, it, like you said, it's not it's not like you know uh, a quid pro quo or like a tit for tat kind of situation. It's more like a hey, look at that over there. Don't look at this over here. Right, you know? right. That that player has just tutored two turns in a row. Exactly. We know that he's got the game in his hand, so we need to do something about that. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And that's, that's the kind of political that's different than most players might see at their kitchen table if they're at a lower power game. Uh, and, and I like that you don't brand yourself specifically as competitive EDH because that's not all that you do on the channel. You've been known to play pet decks and casual decks, but trending higher on that power level scale. Yeah, usually what I, I like to say is uh, I do use the term CEDH a fair bit when I'm talking on social media and whatnot. I do find it's a useful short form. Uh, it's a useful abbreviation to identify the people that are generally receptive to my content. So mm -hmm. it is really useful from an, like, an SEO standpoint. <laughs> but um, I, I don't think it's particularly useful for actually describing what we're doing. Right, um, right. So I'll, I'll say things like the CEDH community. The CEDH community is a thing. It's, mm -hmm. it's an online thing. It exists on Reddit. It exists on Discord. It exists in a bunch of different places. Of course. Um, and those are people that are, you know, members of this community, you know, mm -hmm. not card carrying members, but there are people <laughs> that would identify themselves as CEDH players. Mm -hmm. Um, but generally my deck building philosophy, and I know we're going to get into this, but, uh, my general philosophy when it comes to deck building is I just let decks be as powerful as they're going to be. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't, 
generally were, I don't, I don't start out with a power level in mind. Mm -hmm. I tend to brew the deck. If it ends up powerful, I'll just let it be powerful. And then I just only pull it out when I'm playing against decks that are roughly the same power level. Right. Right. And that's a, a big part of the format in general is having that conversation before you sit down at a table and say, what power level are we playing at? Mm -hmm. uh, do, do you feel that that's one of the biggest benefits of our format that you can sit down and have that conversation with people so that you know that you're on equal or equivalent footing? I think if you're equipped well enough to be able to adapt to a table, like, you know, if you sit down at a table and you think, you know, am I going to be able to play at whatever t power level this table plays at? Mm -hmm. I think that that's a really big benefit. Mm -hmm. uh, not everybody's fortunate enough to do that. Right. But, um, you know, it can be a big drawback if you're not equipped to do that. Because if you show up to EDH night with one deck or two decks and you find out that you are drastically ill-equipped, right? Uh, it can be a real negative experience for everybody at the table because nobody wants to be the person that's, well, I shouldn't say nobody, but most well-adjusted adults don't want to be the one that's pub stomping everybody at their LGS. Right. Um, and you don't want to be on the opposite side of that either. So it can be a real big benefit if you are capable of being equipped to, to adapt like that. Right. And self-censoring is a big part of that, being able to self-limit yourself, knowing that you can go off on turn two and not for the sake of having a better game with people is, is a big part of the social aspect of the format. For sure, for sure. And sometimes it's a it's a matter of, um, you know, I think self-censoring is a great term for it. I think sometimes it's admitting the fact that if there is no common middle ground, that you may enjoy yourself not playing a game with the people that are there, right? Yeah. Is, is that magic is supposed to be a game, EDH is supposed to be a game. Um, if you're not having a good time, then you shouldn't be playing it. Go do something else. You yeah. can enjoy your your time in any number of ways. If there's only three people at your LGS and they are, you know, an uh, order of magnitude, lower or higher power level than where you're prepared to play at, you may have a better time just not playing a game of EDH. Mm -hmm. And that's okay too, you know? Yeah. There's nothing to say that you can't be part of the conversation or the social aspect and not play. You can mm -hmm. sit in a pod of three people playing a game where they're all playing the same power mm -hmm. level and still enjoy the social aspect of having a conversation and being with people and being involved. Just, you know, being the observer as opposed to a player. For sure. For sure. Great. Um, now, uh, we touched on it briefly, and you mentioned uh, the godfather himself, Sheldon, briefly. Mm -hmm. um, you've got, I think, a unique position in the community in that uh, Sheldon has referred to you as a, a trusted advisor at yeah. times. <laughs> Uh, if not an actual member of the commander advisory group, uh, he has been known to seek your counsel on matters pertaining to CEDH. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, my uh, interacting with Sheldon kind of started out uh, as a result of a Twitter thread. Um, it happened actually the day that they updated the commander philosophy document. Mm -hmm. And I basically just posted a, a fairly lengthy thread about what I thought about it. And I guess the one thing that kind of stuck with me was um, it was something to the effect of, uh, you know, the game can be broken fairly easily, but we think it's more fun if you don't. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I kind of mentioned, I'm like, you know, I think we can kind of get there uh, and communicate the philosophy of the format without making value judgments about the, the way that people prefer to play, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's it's kind of a situation where you can say, I, I like playing this way and you can talk about low power, you can talk about high power. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be coupled with a, a comparative statement saying, I like playing this way. It's better than playing another way. I, like, I think a lot of people make that mistake of taking it that one step too far and saying, you know, I like playing this way. And, you know, if you don't like playing that way, then it means you hate fun or it means you want to suck all the air out of the room. Right. right? You know, if, if you ever want a, a sample of the way people talk, um, an example of this, just look at how people talk about stacks players, mm -hmm. stacks control, any kind of hard, like resource denial, that kind of thing. Right. Oh, they're, they're sociopaths. And these are like names that I've been called on Reddit. Yeah. Um, you know, oh, they're sociopaths or, oh, you know, you must be a psychopath or who hurt vilified, you, whatever, right? right? Yeah. And I mean, you can tell sometimes people are saying it and they're, they're, um, they're joking and you can tell they're joking, yeah. right? Um, 
but sometimes like people are actually quite serious about it, you know? And a lot of the time, um, you know, if you listen to Dana Roach talk about this kind of thing, a lot of the time it's rooted in a negative experience that they've had with a real person. So it's not, it's not theoretical to them. Uh, but they're definitely using that negative experience to paint the larger community with with that kind of brush. Yeah, yeah, and and there are some people that will do that. They'll take one negative experience and they'll paint that across the entire format. And uh, we've seen that done with CEDH as a whole. Somebody might sit down at a table and say, "This is my CEDH deck," and play it against a bunch of sevens and eights and blow out the table and then suddenly the other three players at the table say cdh players are terrible and we'll just yep. generalize that statement and i think that that's the the impression that a lot of people get as the same people think that cdh isn't a political format either or isn't a political power level within this format and uh, i think it takes a, a little bit of education and i think the spike feeders do a great job with that yeah, and you know, that's uh, one of the reasons why when we came out of the gate, uh, we we do something that not a lot of people do, and that's that we have base camps. Um, so we don't just show the top-down gameplay. Mm -hmm. That was a choice that I made um, really early in development. Right. Was because um, I, I pretty firmly believe that gameplay content exists on a spectrum. And on mm -hmm. the one side, you've got um, shows that are about the uh, game being played. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, was uh, most of the time uh, CEDH existing content, Lab Maniacs, Team Turn 3, uh, or other gameplay content like uh, MTG Mud Stuff, mm -hmm. is about the game, right? Yes. You you uh, watch Mud Stuff because you want a play-by-play -play of the game that was being played. You and you don't want to watch to that Mud Stuff. Right, yeah, exactly. Oh, those buttery smooth vocals, you know? <laughs> uh, but you don't watch Mud Stuff to uh, get some insight into how the players are interacting. And you don't uh, watch Mudsta to hear the dumb jokes that people make when they're screwing around in their basement, you know? Right, right. And that's a big part of the game, right? That, that is the social element of the game. Well, so when I, uh, when I was kind of, uh, ideating this show, mm -hmm. uh, I was like, well, you know what? I want it to be at least partly about the players because we want to emphasize the fact that, um, you know, once you get past a certain point in power level, the social element doesn't go away, mm -hmm. you know? Like I said, it's not the Pro Tour. It's not the World Series of Poker. Right. It's not earbuds in, sunglasses, hoodie up, kind of, <laughs> you know. Yeah. But but it, it, it is almost akin to professional poker where the slightest tells and facial expressions are part of that. You, it's the, the player interaction and the physical interaction that can be a part of the game. People joke and call magic wizard poker, but mm -hmm. it's not too far off the truth a lot of the times. Well, I think, um, I don't know if you've read the the document. This was, I'm not sure if it still is, but it was pinned on the um, CDH subreddit for quite a while. And there was one aspect of it that I really liked. It's a document called Playing Playing Commander to Win or Playing EDH to Win. And it's kind of a play on the, the book Playing to Win, which I believe is about poker. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was written by Razley Ox, who's uh, you know not really active in the community anymore. But one of the things that it talked about was empathy and not not empathy in the like interpersonal i care about you kind of thing but empathy as opposed to like i can put myself in your shoes and accurately predict how you're going to react to yes. certain things right and um that is a big element of of uh, the strategy of commander is because you can say okay i have access to all of the free information that you have access to and you just fired off a demonic tutor what do i think you tutored for Right. And then that's going to inform my decisions on how I play. Yep. And that's where that poker element kind of comes in. Exactly, exactly. One of my favorite elements of this game is being able to accurately call the cards in another player's hand, knowing what their last couple actions were and what mana they have untapped. Uh, yep. that, that is one of the most satisfying elements for me sitting down and playing with someone. And yep. in, in this, this new age of webcam magic, where you're playing via webcam and a lot of the actual human element is taken from it, it's become that much harder. Uh, I am grateful that we get to play magic, but there is something to be said about the, the physical aspect of it being removed. Yeah, it's different. Um, that's, uh, you know, that, that physical element being removed is one of the reasons why I don't play arena and I don't play MTGO. I never have. I, I don't enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I know I don't enjoy it. I've tried it. It's just, it's not for me. 
And webcam magic, I didn't play really. I had a couple times, but I didn't really play before um, you know the pandemic hit. Mm-hmm. Uh, specifically for that reason, is because there was that sort of one step of removal involved, mm-hmm. right? I, I can't sit and look at you, right? I can't see what you're thinking. Yeah. You know, that's a huge part of it for me. So Absolutely. now, webcam magic, I've been playing a fair bit of it, you know, since the pandemic hit, mm-hmm. because it is uh, better than not playing magic. <laughs> And in my opinion, it's better than Arena and MTGO because you at least have something. You have mm-hmm. the person's voice. You can talk to people. You can. The other thing is that you can kind of diffuse tension as well. I find because there's a lot of really tense moments in Magic games, yeah. and cracking a joke or complimenting somebody on a play yeah. can go a long way to to setting the tone of a game. You know, just socially. Absolutely. Is that you know, hey, oh, that was a good player. I'm glad you countered that, or uh, you know, that's a sweet part of your deck that uh, you know, people like that. It keeps the the tone airy, you know. Yeah, and, and even communicating through the the new hand gestures, where you only get top down, and you've got to give mm-hmm. okay symbols and wave things through and show how yep. many cards are in your hand. Just that little bit is kind of the. It, it gives you something more than you get from being disconnected on other sides of arena or MTGO. I'm with yeah. you. Yeah. Or, you know, you got to go AFK for a minute. Hey, I got to hit the bathroom or, Hey, I got to, you know, refill my drink or crack another beer or something like yeah. that. And, you know, you're not just watching the rope burn down. You know? <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Um, so, uh, so we, we talked about, uh, getting into the new season on spike feeders. Are we going to see some of the decks that you're known for make an appearance this season? We might see, uh, you know, we, our first episode aired, you know, it's the 13th today. Uh, so our first episode of this new season aired a few days ago. Um, I was playing a Brow and Shabraz deck. I didn't brew this, but mm-hmm. I am head over heels in love with it. Like, Absolutely. It, it's I'm one not, of my favorite new ones too. Oh, I, like I'm not known for this deck, but I'm going to be playing it so much that at some point, um, you know, it'll just, it's just part of my arsenal now, right? It's part of my, my box of decks that I take. Um, I will probably be playing bears and cars. Uh, there have been some new great bears. Mm-hmm. Uh, released in the last little while. Really excited about that. Yeah, and uh, uh, b- before we get into a little bit about bears and cars, for for anybody that hasn't heard of this deck, this is a signature gym from the Spike Feeders deck that you've played multiple times on the channel. You've played it on other channels as well. Uh, why, why don't you uh, tell everybody the premise behind bears and cars? Yeah, the the idea is. Um, I can tell you kind of what started it was it was the idea of i liked playing hate bears i like playing stacks and uh one of the the main drawbacks of playing hate bears is that you know if you're not playing a combo win you don't really have any way to advance your game state right Mm -hmm. you you do a really good job of slowing the game down to a crawl right everybody's swimming in molasses but you just really have nowhere to go from there and you just end up watching somebody else win really slowly right so i said well what can we do you know, I took, to, I took a look at other formats and I said, well, what do other formats do when they're playing hate bears? Like, what does death and taxes do? What is, what do all these like tempo decks do? Um, they'll stick a big threat and then they'll control the game and just beat down with the big threat, whether it's like Tarmogoy for whether it's Delver, or whether it's whatever, right? Mm-hmm. They'll stick a threat that's good enough to provide a clock and then they will, uh, use that to close up the game. So I said, well, wouldn't that be kind of fun if we had a, a hate bears um, list that one with combat damage? Mm-hmm. So uh, this actually started out as a, a Nea brawl deck under Samut, uh, oh, Voice wait. of Descent, uh, because there were a lot of good red hate bears mm-hmm. in standard at the time. There was like Harsh Mentor, and there was like Kanjali Sunwing, and... Um, what was the other one? Takatli Honor Guard. There was like a yes. lot of really good hate bears in standard at the time, right around Ixalan. Mm-hmm. And uh, and there were also these vehicles. And I said, well, you know what? These are bodies. Like they're not enchantments. They're not artifacts. We're not playing like, you know, Ensnaring Bridge. We're playing Takatli Honor Guard. So why don't we use the body, right? Yes. So I figured, well, if we can use these to crew vehicles, then we, the vehicles can be these big threats, right? And at a CEDH table, at least at the time, it's a little bit different now. But at least at the time, if you've got a 4-4 or a 5-5, it doesn't even need evasion because people aren't blocking it. Yeah. Because they're either blocking with their mana dorks or they're blocking with Timna or whatever. Right. 
they're sacrificing their card advantage if they block. So you could actually put people on a decent clock. And then every once in a while, you'd stick a turn one Sarah Ascendant and just beat people for sex. <laughs> and just run away with it. <laughs> yeah. So that was kind of the, the idea behind Bears and Cars was, you know, we stick uh, these hate bears, which are, uh, you know, creatures with uh, detrimental abilities, usually pretty aggressively costed, mm-hmm. and then use the bodies to crew vehicles so that they can we can kind of eke a little bit more benefit out of a hate bear than just having it providing a de- detrimental effect. Absolutely. And it has always reminded me of modern's mono white taxes mm-hmm. that uh, plays the all of the hate bears, the Thalias and uh, the Vryn wing mares and the like, mm-hmm. and uses them to crew smuggler's copter mm-hmm. to get in not only for the damage, but for the looting ability. For the cards. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and like there are some vehicles, Weatherlight, and uh, weather, like the card advantage on Weatherlight is bonkers. Right. If you've never cast this card, I would highly recommend it. Yeah. Uh, or the other one is Sky Sovereign console flagship. Is yes. it pops dorks like it's it's basically Inferno Titan. Like, yeah. But but with evasion and uh, <laughs> exactly <laughs> is uh, is is fantastic. The the that's the the kind of deck that at the time you wouldn't see in the format. But the format has started evolving. Uh, we, we're starting to see a lot more bodies on the mm-hmm. field in higher power level games. Uh, with Flash Band, we're starting to see the farm lists, as they're called, mm-hmm. show up more and more often. Is a deck like Bears and Cars evolving around that? And, and how do you take your deck lists and tune them and tweak them? You know, I haven't played Bears and Cars I don't think at all since the flash ban. Because uh, okay. the flash ban happened in, what was that, February or January? And uh, we went down to Ohio to play with Playing With Power. Mm-hmm. Uh, I played Bears and Cars a couple games there. Uh, but I really haven't played it since the flash ban. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's just because we haven't really played much Magic. Right. But I would say Bears and Cars probably a little worse positioned. Uh, some of the more pushed newer commanders like Corvold and stuff like that mm-hmm. are four fours or, or bigger. And that presents a bit of a problem because we can't reliably get in for damage if we can't profitably attack. Right. And then at that point, we're back to square one with the original problem of hate bears, which is, you know, you've just got these hate bears out and, you know, nothing's happening. <laughs> right, right. And so. In those situations, I would probably pivot to a little bit more of a combo strategy. The deck decidedly does not have a combo in it. Right. Um, but it could. It could run Helm Rip. It could run, you know, any of the, you know, I'm running um, Esper right now mm-hmm. with Tim, Tim and Silas Rand. You could run anything that Esper has in terms of combo. And there's a few of them. Yeah. Um, and uh, one, one of the new hate bears that has come out since the last time that you've played the deck is Draneth Magistrate who oh is very quickly becoming a little bit of a boogeyman in yeah. the format, especially at the higher power level tables, mm-hmm. since he comes down before the Timnas and sometimes the Thrasios as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, there's been a few. Like, Dranath Magistrate is is like the most recent in a long line of really incredible hate bears that they've been printing. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kunoros, uh, Hound of Athreos is another one that came out that's just... Hushbringer's wow. one of my favorites too. Hushbringer puts in work. That yes. card is a house. Yes. Um, yeah. So is that how you see White getting more of a foothold at the higher power level tables? For the longest time, the only reason to include White was for Timna, uh, for that card advantage in the command zone. But now it's getting a lot of tools and it's getting a lot of bodies. Are, are you starting to see it more and more often in your games and at your tables and maybe planned for the upcoming season? Yeah, you know, White's always been <laughs> the, the kind of the weird thing about our games is part of making CEDH interesting and more palatable and growing the format is kind of showing what's possible in the format, not necessarily what is the best in the format. So it does kind of run contrary to the idea of CEDH because we're not necessarily playing the best thing that's available in every episode that we film. I generally like to uh, look at a list and I say, okay, could this reasonably, like, would I be embarrassed to sit down (laughs) at a CEDH table and play this deck? Yeah, would I get laughed out of the pod? Yeah, like if it can hang, I'll play it. Mm -hmm. 
I'm, I'm not like, I'm not so proud that I can't lose a game, right? Yeah. So as an example for this weekend, I'm actually playing uh, a mono red Bosch KCI list. Oh, wow. And I'm very happy about it. Uh-huh. Um, I just put it together today. And I mean, like, are there better shells for KCI? Sure, you could play Emery or you could play Urza or you could play like any number. You could play Joyra. Um, but have you ever seen Bosch at a CEDH table? No. And there's value in that, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, and I, I've told a story on Twitter before about getting laughed out of a CEDH pod for bringing Varals oh, yeah. and Golgari Hulk, a Golgari yeah. Hulk list oh, yeah. before the flash ban. And the the other three players were saying, why would you play Hulk without Flash? Yeah. And they nearly laughed me out of that pod. And then I comboed off on turn three. Yep. Uh, and that shut them up right there. Yep. So sometimes you'll sit down with unconventional commanders and it's less about the commander and more about what the deck can do and the mm-hmm. list itself. We've seen you play Nin the Pain Artist and Sir Q Demir Lobotomist. Mm-hmm. At the table as well. Those are are ones that can have good potential, but you don't see them very often in a format full of Najilas and First Slivers and Timnathrasios. Yep. And you know, uh, it's it's actually funny. The first time that I posted my NIN list on the CEDH subreddit, this is before we started making, but well, maybe not before I started making content, but before we started making content as the Spike Beaters, mm-hmm. uh, I posted my NIN list. And the first response on that thread was I'm surprised you've ever won a game with this. (laughs) And granted, like it wasn't as good as any of my decks are today. Mm -hmm. Um, It wasn't great. It was basically, it was a Nin. uh, It was very heavily inspired by like Legacy Mud. Mm -hmm. uh, And the combos that I had in it were Staff of Domination, Metalworker, and Mind Over Matter. And um, uh what did we have? We had Mind Over Matter in there, Grim Monolith, uh, Power Artifact. Like mm-hmm. it was, it was that kind of combo deck, right? With some Miles Stacks elements, and uh, I drew some inspiration from Brian Weissman's uh, Nin One V One list. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, basically, it was it was kind of a Nin One V One list that had been adapted for multiplayer, right? And it wasn't great, but it's that kind of attitude of um, dismissiveness. That yes. really rubs me the wrong way, and right. that's that's kind of how we try to um, how we tried to form our community. Was you know what? We don't know if it's good. Why don't you try it, and then we'll know, right? You know? And, and if it's good, we might be surprised. <laughs> that that is one of the things that I love about how the community has shaped up. I uh, I'm, I'm a member of your Discord. I recommend it highly for everybody. Uh, but there are some crazy brews that happen in there and everybody is super welcoming about mm-hmm. it. Somebody will, will pause it a question and you'll have three different deck lists within 10 minutes from different people and a full discourse will happen about it. And that's incredible. Uh, it's, it's the, the people that are dismissive of the rogue brews and people trying things new that uh, limit the format. Um, and mm-hmm. it's the channels that try and do, uh, do new things, try and play with new decks and unheard of commanders that try and innovate. And that's one of the reasons why people love the Spike Feeders content. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, uh, I, I've, I've always like, you know, I don't know if, uh, this is kind of not the magic world, but, um, Sir Ken Robinson gave a TED talk about, uh, uh education and creativity. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the the takeaways from that TED Talk is uh, if you're always afraid of being wrong, you'll never come up with anything original. Right. And that that like stuck with me. That is such a it's such a true statement. And if you if you get cornered into only trying things that you are no guaranteed are going to work, yes. Not only do you not understand why they work, because you don't have those experiences of I tried something else and it didn't work, so I know that this is the way I should do it. Right. You've kind of always been spoon fed that steady diet of you know this works, so you should only do it this way. Yeah, and but, what what works for one person might not work for another. Uh, you you don't know until you try, and failure is one of the best teachers. And you know, with how varied uh, local metas can be, uh, it could be that the you know deckless database version of a deck is not suited to the meta that you're playing in absolutely and uh i think we're probably going to get into that a little bit uh a little bit later but um 
Yeah, like one thing that uh, Flash Hulk was never really a problem in our meta. We had one player, exactly one player that was playing it. And it was never, it never, you know, ran away with anything um, because we all pretty successfully metagamed against it. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, our uh, meta, the Spike Feeders local meta, mm -hmm. took a hard shift towards mid range and hate bears long before the Flash Hog ban. Like wow. I'm talking years, years before the Flash Hog ban. Wow. Because that's the predictable result is when yeah. Flash Hog isn't a problem, everybody plays mid range. Yeah. And, it's uh, the rock, paper, scissors, right. uh, back and forth, right? Yeah, so when I was posting my Nindec on the competitive EDH subreddit, you know, a few years ago, mm -hmm. you know, people were viewing it through the lens of the current online meta or what was the current online meta. Mm -hmm. And they're saying, well, this can't stack up against Flash Hulk or this can't stack up against whatever the flavor of the week commander was. Right. And I'd say, well, that's not really what I'm playing against. So. Yeah. You know, these pyroclasms are great for me. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And that's one of my favorite things to do as well. Now that the format has kind of shifted to uh, Demonic Consultation, Thassa's Oracle, I mm -hmm. love playing spoiler decks where mm -hmm. you're the person who has to police the table uh, and you're sitting there with all of the counter magic or you're the one who's pointing out they've just tutored, they have the mana on turn two, to consultation oracle mm -hmm. uh we need to do something about this get the, the table on it and that's that's For the sure. way my personal meta has shifted i'm playing uh divergent kaikar as mm -hmm. a, a spoiler deck so yeah. uh i i have to kind of keep everybody on track <laughs> yeah just keeping them honest right this right is, this is fair magic one spell per turn <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and that, that actually, uh, brings me to how I feel the CDH, uh, kind of rock, paper, scissors is evolving is now that we're seeing a lot of mid range and we're seeing a lot of bodies on the table, we're going to find a lot of board wipes coming back. Uh, and we're going to see a lot of the three damage board wipes in particular, the sweltering oh, yeah. suns, the anger of the gods, uh, even the variable ones like earthquakes being uh -huh. played more and more often uh, in order to police this format, in order to sure. play spoiler. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, that that kind of plays into our brew for today, too. Yeah. You have a spicy one that we want to talk about. Uh, why don't you, you let us know what we're interested in brewing today? Yeah, so this actually, you know, kind of harkens back to my days playing in. Um, I remember there's a guy, Colby, in our, in our local meta, uh, shout out, by the way, Colby, if you're uh, watching this. But um, back when I was playing in, we played at a, a local 5K. There was a commander tournament at a local side, the 5K as a side event. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was playing in, and he was playing Marath Hate Bears. Right. And I'll tell you, I could not stick a single X1 on the board for longer than half a turn rotation before right. it got popped by this Marath. <sighs> and so... I, you know, whenever we do quick Q and A episodes or anything like that, I, people frequently ask me, like, what's one commander that you, you know, have tried to make work, but you just can't get it there. Right. right. And I usually tell them one of two things. I'll tell them either Slimefoot because I love Slimefoot, uh, or I'll tell them Marath because I wanted to get it there. And mm -hmm. I've tried a couple times. I actually had a dream once where, uh, I, I like, I don't know. I woke up and I thought to myself, Marath food chain. And I'm like, this is so cool. And then I like started brewing a deck. I actually had like 60 cards put into this deck. Wow. And then I showed it to the Spike Feeders Facebook chat. And Bill says to me, you can't use food chain mana to activate abilities. Right. And I'm like, oh, uh, uh. yeah. <laughs> and that was the end of Marath food chain. Uh, it, it lived for all of about 45 minutes. So. Right. And, and it, it's interesting because Merith Food Chain might not work, but there are a lot of cards that work with uh, Merith in order to get a ton of value and in order to go near infinite with very, very easily. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were talking about playing spoiler now that the format mm -hmm. is shifting to mid range and there are a lot of creatures on the table. Merith is almost like a walking ballista in the command zone, uh, able to take out a lot of these smaller creatures, able to deny the mana dorks, and a little later in the game, able to kill on sight the Thrasios and the Kinnons that are starting to really snowball the format. 
Yeah, and beyond that, it puts up blockers for Tuna, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, taking away profitable blocks takes away card advantage. Um, so that's that's a big, big thing. Uh, so how how were you seeing the deck approached? Is this a hate bear deck? Is this a board control deck? Is this trying to go big mana and ping down your opponents with Maris ability? Yeah, uh, you know, it's it's kind of funny because whenever I uh, think about playing a deck, I think about the the core idea of the deck and I try to guess at how fast it's going to be, mm -hmm. right? So are we going to be the ones that are pushing the action in the game? Right. And if we're not, I generally try to think about how do we make enough time and space to actually do what we plan on doing? Right. Because it's all fun and good to say, okay, my plan is to make big mana and uh and um you know, use Merat to ping people out. And that's fine, but it takes you, you know, X turns, say, let's say seven turns to make big mana, right? right. And I mean, that's just a totally arbitrary number. Mm -hmm. But if it takes you seven turns, what are you doing in terms one through six to make sure that the game doesn't end right. before you can get to that end game? So in the spirit of making time and space, you're either playing stacks elements, you're either playing control, or uh, you have to be able to modify your game plan to move up the action to earlier turns. So right. that people have to start worrying about you rather than you worrying about them. Right, right. And that's all about the, the quality of your early threats and your early bodies and how what you're doing is affecting the rest of the players, especially in a Naya deck that's not playing blue. You need to be more proactive than reactive a lot of the time. So you're looking to stick that Sarah Ascendant on turn one. You're looking to stick that Dranith Magistrate on turn two. You're looking to stick that Collector Oof and mm -hmm. slow everybody else down while you get that combo together, while you start generating that mana, and while you start ensuring that nobody else is able to progress but you. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, I do like the idea of, of incorporating a big mana element. This is probably using green for something like an elf ball package or, mm -hmm. um, you know, something along those lines. And then the priest of uh, Titania is the yeah. regular mana dorks, right? Yeah. Uh, I also really like, uh, and it, it's not something that you see in the format very often, but unbound, unbound flourishing. <laughs> Boy, I love Unbound, Unbound Flourishing. Yes. I can't talk too much about it because it's come up, become a bit of a meme on our Discord. <laughs> right. But I do have Unbound Flourishing slotted into a deck. It's a casual deck that I'm going to play on the channel. Nice. Uh, and it's why people have been asking on our Discord about Boyle, Shadowmoor, Roisin Meanderers. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. And, okay. Uh, so I do have something coming along those lines on the casual side of things. But uh, yes, I do love Unbound Flourishing. And, and it works really well with Marath because it does double up that X ability that she uses. And uh, I, I will have a picture of Marath down below. She is a mouthful, so I'm not going to read out all of her abilities here. But we'll, we'll make sure that uh, everybody knows what what Marath does and what kind of combos and synergies we can look at in order to ensure that we've got our value engine and perhaps our combo win piece in the command zone. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you know, a couple quick notes about Marath if you're reading it right now. Uh, X can't be zero. That was uh, day one errata. Yep. And uh, also you can't use food chain mana to activate the ability. Just keep that in mind. <laughs> That that isn't in the gatherer uh, <laughs> erratas. That is uh, that is yeah. That's fact. a that's a Jim Lepage special. I won't, <laughs> won't charge you for that bit of advice. <laughs> uh, so so uh, unbound flourishing with Marath doubles up on that ability. Uh, and one of the ways that you can easily go infinite with that is with something like an Ashnod's Altar mm -hmm. and unbound flourishing and Marath. Those three mm -hmm. get you infinite mana. Uh, so that's a nice little efficient package. Uh, altogether, it's eight mana, but it's not something that you need to have out in a single turn. Exactly. Uh, you can very easily have Marath out or have Alter out or have Unbound Flourishing out and drop the other pieces when you need to. Marath does not need to tap in order to activate the ability. So summoning sickness need not apply. Yep. And, and one thing that's, uh, you know, a benefit there when I think about colors that I'm playing in a deck, 
the great part about having a combo uh, with pieces like that, when you've got a, a piece of a combo that is, you know, your commander is in the command zone. Mm-hmm. If it was just your commander in the command zone, people would generally refer to that as a zero card combo. That's mm-hmm. something like Godo with Helm of Awakening. Or a, a point um, so five card combo, yeah, exactly, right? Like you've got to get something out, but you always have access to it, right? Yes. Uh, but the great part about uh, something like Ashnod's Altar and Unbound Flourishing, because it's an artifact and an enchantment, the tutors that tutor for one generally also tutor for the other. Yes. So things like Enlightened Tutor, mm-hmm. things like Sterling Grove. Mm-hmm. Um, not only will Sterling Grove protect half of your combo, yes, uh, but it can also be used to tutor for half of your combo, right? Um, but I, although I don't think that tutors for artifacts, but the idea is. You know, the artifact and enchantment synergies tend to be at least adjacent, if not overlapping. Right. And this is a combo that wants to focus more on activated abilities than it does casting spells, meaning that a lot of the hate bears that we're going to include don't slow down what we're doing, Uh but rather slow down our opponents while we decide what we're doing, while we get ready to do what we're doing. Yeah, but, and that's an important note too. Is that you? You know, you kind of want to toss an asterisk there to to revisit later. Is that you specifically want to avoid the things that are going to shut off your combo? Things like, um, you know, uh, Linvala and yes. things like uh, Suppression Field, and you know, those those are you know hate pieces that you might otherwise consider in a Nea deck mm-hmm. that are just not going to have a place in this. Well, I, I mentioned Collector Oof as well. Uh, that's a, a great combo piece, but shuts off your Ashnod's Altar. Uh, something like uh, Cursed Totem, right, is going to prevent you from being able to activate uh, Marath as well, yeah. right, or a, a Null know, Rod. Although on on a deck like this, I probably would still go with Collector Oof. Uh, and my rationale behind that would be that you can use Marath to get rid of Collector Oof when you no longer need it. Right. And the fact that the way that you're building your deck, um, you know, when you're talking about symmetrical effects like this, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, when you talk about Collector Oof, the idea is it's a symmetrical effect, which is why you can get it so cheaply, right? Because if, if it was just your opponents, it would probably cost one or two more mana, right? But because it is all of your opponents, you can build your deck in a way that breaks the synergy just by virtue of the fact that you're not playing very many artifacts. Right, right. So if, if you're a Nea, you're probably relying more on the green side of ramp as opposed to the artifact side of ramp. So right. you could still play good artifact ramp like mana, uh, like mana crypt and Mox uh, diamond. diamond. Yep. I would probably draw the line there. You might be able to make a case for something like Chrome Mox. Mm-hmm. But uh, if you're really only playing, you know, two artifacts plus Ashnod's altar, um, it's effectively asymmetrical right. at that point. Especially and, since you can break the synergy on command if you've got your access to your commander. Exactly. Uh, and I may make the argument for including something like Skull Clamp mm-hmm. uh, so that you can use the creatures that Marath is mm-hmm. creating to get the card draw engine going because these are colors that aren't going to have an overabundance of card draw, unlike black or blue. Yeah, for sure. For right. sure. So we aren't going to be running the Ristic studies, so we're going to have to have some kind of card draw engine in the works. Green's definitely going to help us with things like Sylvan Library, uh, but we aren't going to be able to include any other artifact draw apart from that. We're going to be yeah. creating a lot of 1-1s. We're going to be killing off a lot of our mana dorks later in the game when they become redundant. So turning them into two cards each is definitely useful. For sure. For sure. And I mean, it's unfortunate because when we're playing red, when you talk about card advantage, this is when you're talk, playing about red and white specifically, um, the lack of card advantage, there are some good things in red that you can be doing uh, to net card advantage. Bomat Courier is one of them, but mm-hmm. being an artifact and a creature with an activated ability, it probably doesn't have a place in this deck. But that is the type of creature that I would look at for red card advantage if we weren't playing this specific deck. Right, right. Um, now, uh, we, we talk about shutting off artifacts, but there is one red card in the format that makes artifacts that I would also argue oh, belongs oh in the deck. Boy. Oh boy. And that is, uh, of course, Dockside Extortionist. It uh, is. He is a staple in the format, without a doubt. Uh, and being able in this kind of deck to land a Dockside Extortionist on turn two or three and make four to six treasure tokens is something that could easily take this from a, a turn five or six deck into a turn three 
deck. And yeah. that's, that's why it's that good. And some incidental synergies with Temer Sabretooth, which we we'll right. in, can include a little later that as well. combo as well. Yeah. Uh, that way you can do things like bounce uh, the Dockside Extortionist uh, and be able to pump Marath uh, and use Marath's ability over and over again with those tokens. Get yeah. Once you get that infinite mana, you've got infinite damage with Marath. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so For sure. Very, very easy combos there. Uh, there are lots of great ways to make infinite mana to turn Marath into your win con, as well as that police at the table. For sure. Um, now, uh, we, we see a lot in this format of the three toughness creatures really starting to rule the roost. Uh, Timna's, the Thrasios, the, um, the Draenith Magistrates, the the three toughness is really a strange place to be because a lot of decks run pyroclasms or can run pyroclasms or mm-hmm. the flame sweeps, but that's still two damage. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, I mentioned running three damage sweepers in my spoiler decks. Uh, do, do you feel that that's something that we'd want to include in this, even though we're very hate bear heavy? It, it could be. Um, one thing that we might look at doing, especially if we we're playing a lot of the three toughness creatures, uh, we might look at using Marath to supplement the two damage sweepers, right? Mm-hmm. So if you've got a board that you're staring down of, you know, three or four mana dorks and uh, a couple Timnas and, you know, two, three mana or three toughness creatures, you could pop off that two mana uh, board wipe or the two two damage board wipe, and then use Marath to kill the two three toughness creatures. Right. So you know it's it's not always going to be a board full. A lot of the time it'll only be one or two. Mm-hmm. And then uh, you know quite often if you can fire those off on command, you can be a little more surgical with it mm-hmm. and maybe just target the Timmas or just target the Kinnons or you know you don't have to fire off the two mana board wipes all the time if you can shut off the engines. Right. right. Perfect. Perfect. So, so it sounds like we've got a nice little shell here. We know what we're going to be including from a creature base standpoint. We're going to look at a lot of the hate bears from white, from red, a lot of the mana dorks from green. We know what some of our win cons are going to be, what some of our combos are to generate infinite mana, to make Marath as big as we need, to ping down all of our opponents. What do our spells package look like or what does our spells package look like apart from some of the tutors that we've mentioned i well i mean tutors are going to be a big one (laughs) um especially you know whenever you're looking at a deck that doesn't really have the card advantage to reliably draw into its win cons Mm -hmm. you definitely have to think about the tutor packages this is the one thing um when i was brewing uh saskia um my saskia deck Mm -hmm. it's very centrally focused on one card Yes. Um, and whenever you've got a, a, you know, an EDH deck that is very centrally focused on a couple cards, any tutor that you can uh, include to tutor that card up is a functionally an extra copy of it that costs a couple extra mana, you know? Right. Um, but beyond the tutors, I would look at um, card velocity and selection wherever we can. Things like Sylvan Library, mm-hmm. things like... Um, like you mentioned, Skull Clamp, I think would be a good include. Uh, anything that is going to draw you cards, you might look at something like Runic Armasaur. Yes, um, love it. You know, especially if you're if you are going to be playing into a dork heavy meta, mm-hmm. um, something like Runic Armasaur can uh, you know even just incidentally off of fetches and whatnot can net you a lot of advantage. Mm-hmm. Um, I would probably also look at. Hmm, you might look at something like uh, Faithless Looting, you know, cards with with selection and card draw, but not necessarily increasing your card advantage, just right. increasing your card velocity. Right. right, the card quality, yeah. Exactly. If, you, if you're not able to search for the specific cards that you need, you want to see as many cards as you possibly can. You absolutely, know? absolutely. Uh, and um, with, with some of the tutors that we have, they are essentially wild cards in our hands. If you draw something like a Worldly Tutor or an Eladomri's Call, we know that that can very quickly get us another part of a two-creature combo package like Dockside Extortionist, Team, or Sabretooth to get infinite mana and win with Marath. Mm-hmm. Um, or Enlightened Tutor or Sterling Grove to tutor up artifacts yep. and enchantments. And uh, that's also going to make it very beneficial for us to have something like a Smothering Tithe 
in the deck too. Fantastic in the format. We're running red, so uh, Wheel of Fortune is card draw that we're going to want to include too, because in a deck without blue and black, we're likely going to run low on cards very quickly, play out our hand very quickly, refilling it is going to be something that we're going to want to do. For sure, for sure. You know, there there are a couple options that you can take. You know, there's there's cards that are available to you in go wide strategies for card draw. Mm-hmm. Um, things like, and I always get these mixed up, but Shamanic Revelation, I believe, is the go tall one. Mm-hmm. And there is a Garuk themed card that does something very similar, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so the go the Shamanic Revelation is draw a card for each creature you control, gain four life. Uh, for each one with power four or greater. Yes, and, the, and then there's one that's draw equal to your greatest power. That's a Return of the control. Wild Speaker. That's, that's the, the one. That's the correct one. one. That, yeah. that one also has the benefit of being modal in that you can give all non-humans you control plus three plus three, which may just steal a game once in a while. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and that's the kind of thing. Like I've stolen a few games using like fairly modest finale of devastations as right. well. Um, because you know x equals five is a lot of damage. <laughs> yeah, especially when you're you're pumping an elvish mystic and a yeah. land of war elves to six sixes right. and yeah. swinging through. Uh, th- this is a format where people get very greedy with life totals. Uh, mm-hmm. That's why the the uh, the mid range format is shaping up the way that it is. Is because just pecking in for four or five damage over the course of two or three turns puts pressure on that player that wants to play an ad nauseum and wants to dump 30 life into an ad nauseum to draw 30 cards. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, um, <laughs> we've had a couple examples of that happening on the channel. I know uh, there is one specific episode that I'm thinking of. I can't remember which one it was, but Elliot fired off a Doomsday. <laughs> and spent, uh, we cut this out, but he spent probably 15 or 20 minutes building a doomsday pile. Right. And like going over all the things, going over all the things. And, um, and he goes, okay, I'm going to activate top or whatever he did to crack his pile or he casts like a Kitaxi probe or something like that. Right. He went to go crack his pile and I'm like, okay, activate memory jar, you're dead. <laughs> <laughs> and, oh. uh, you know, so it's not even just life totals in those situations, but I have had situations where I fired off like non-infinite comet storms at people who either cast Doomsday or they just happen to be at four life because of a greedy Adnaz or whatever. And I'm just like comet storm X equals four, yeah. you know. Uh, and that's a that's one of the reasons why I love uh, new addition to the format Calamax. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, not not the most competitive. You won't see them at many competitive tables, but just the value you get off of doubling up on something like a, a Comet Storm for three and being able to take two opponents out with it because they've got that low or being the biggest creature on the table because you've copied two spells is yeah. a- enough to put a lot of pressure on a lot of players. Never mind the draw spells that you're able to double up on. Uh, I don't think I've had a more satisfying feeling in the past few months of playing Magic than doubling up on a uh, dig through time with oh. Kalamax because oh. that is just uh, chef's kiss <laughs> in terms of value. <laughs> it's like if you've ever played Thousand Year Storm, some yes. of these cards, like if you've ever played Thousand Year Storm, even like a super modest storm count makes Manamorphose the best spell you've ever cast. Oh, in your life, absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the, there's a, a new enchantment uh, out of M21 double vision that just doubles the first instant or sorcery you cast every turn. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so it's just, it's Calamax's tapped ability on an enchantment all the time, yep. Yep. Uh, which, I mean, just that's a ton of value. That is just fantastic. Double counter spells can be really oppressive too. Um, right. You know, they're not always oppressive, but in the situations where you need it to come through, it comes through, you know? Right. Uh, because like a double counter spell in, you know, eight times out of 10, it does the exact same thing as a single counter spell. But if you're ever in a situation where somebody is about to start a counter war, you've got double counter spells, they're just not even going to engage, right? Yeah. Because they know that they can't beat you on it. Yeah. Um, and that's like virtual card advantage, like somebody not taking an action because they know that it's not going to work out favorable. You've just saved a card. You still have that card in your hand, you know? Yeah. And, and that player might be gearing up to win and say, if that person has one counter spell in their hand, even if they're able to double it up, 
I can win through that counter war. Mm -hmm. But then they're discounting everybody else at the table. I know that nobody else has into any interaction and just that ability to put them on the back foot and saying is now the time to go off and giving you one more turn to get closer to winning. Mm -hmm. Those are the kind of interactions and those are the kind of little mind gamey pieces of uh, the political aspect of this that make it satisfying being able to mm -hmm. call someone's bluff or have them call your bluff and say, I might as well go for it. If if I don't go for it and uh, and I could have won, then I'm going to kick myself. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. So uh, it sounds like for Marath, we've got a good shell right now. We've got uh, a few routes to infinite. Uh, we've got a good way to control the table. We've got some good ramp packages to get some big mana. Uh, sounds like we're on a good route. Uh, how about an interaction package? Do we want to go with classics like uh, Pyroblast and Red Elemental Blast in here? Sorts to Plowshares. Uh, oh, deflecting Swat. Oh. Deflecting Swat is uh, another one of the best additions to the format. Oh. Uh, I, I've oh. been blown out by it a couple of times now. So it's like, a, I think I've had more blowouts involving Deflecting Swat than I have with Fierce Guardianship. Like, right. I, Elliot went to go and recur a food chain. Uh, this actually might even be in the episode that's coming up in our next episode, but he went to go and recur food chain. He was like, okay, uh, Noxious Revival targeting my food chain. And it was his last ditch effort. We had, <laughs> we countered his food chain like a million times. He goes, okay, Noxious Revival counter my food chain. And I'm like, um, no, deflecting SWAT, you're going to give me back my force of will. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm like, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Th those kind of blowouts are amazing. The fact that it is not just spell, but ability yeah. on deflecting SWAT is mm -hmm. incredible. Uh, it's, it's those kind of little things that take a card from being really good mm -hmm. and a variant on something that we've seen in the format to something that is an instant staple in the mm -hmm. format. And now, do you feel that these new spells out of the Commander 20 project uh, product, the, the ones that are free if you control your commander, are they uh, encouraging people to play lower to the ground commanders, the two and three casting cost commanders? I think they probably are. I mean, that was probably happening in CEDH, like the CEDH meta um, that was happening to begin with. Mm -hmm. You know, people weren't really playing those big commanders with the exception of like Gitrog and, you know, a handful of others. But mm -hmm. um, I think that that's kind of naturally happening is that people are slowly figuring out what's good. Mm -hmm. um, part of that is content creators, um, you know, will tend to showcase the, the stuff that's a little bit on the better side. Mm -hmm. um, but some of it is just that there's more to read about. There's more EDH theory out there. You know, Absolutely. when I started playing EDH, there was like one, maybe two podcasts. It was like the command zone was just starting up. There was a podcast called um, Command Cast mm -hmm. with Andy. They really liked. Um, oh, I forget which one it is. One of the one of the goblins, Ib Halfheart, I think it was. <laughs> and right. uh, but that was that was like that was it for EDH content. So yeah. Um, yeah, I think people are just kind of trying to they're they're figuring out a very complicated format. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of, it's been happening slowly. I think if you were to plot average converted mana cost index over time, it's probably at least a full point or two lower than it was five years ago. Right. And we're, we're seeing that trend even lower because people are trying to play these ad nauseum decks, mm -hmm. knowing that their life totals are pressured the way that they are because we're in a mid range format right now so people are looking to bring those curves as low as possible i've oh. seen people stop playing force of will because they don't want to flip five damage on an atnos yeah i mean when so when we first started the spike feeders i remember having a conversation with elliot about ad nauseum and we said you know the general uh you know knowledge at the time was you know you don't play ad nauseum unless your cmc your average converted mana cost in your deck of non-land cards is between two and 2.2 mm -hmm. And now, I mean, we're talking about between 1.2 and 1.4. Yeah. You know, like even in CDH, it's come down a full point for ad nauseum decks, easily a full point. Yeah. And that is drastic. Because mm -hmm. um, to hit 1.2 average converted mana cost is you're just playing one drops. Yeah. Yeah. Basically. Everything in the deck is one drops. It's tribal yeah. one drops in yep. CDH, is what yeah. it is now. For uh, sure. 
But uh, I, I think that that's very interesting because that puts this Merith deck in a interesting position because not only can you pressure the board presence, not only can you pressure the the dorks, the one mana cost mana accelerants that people are playing, but you can pressure life totals. Yeah. And if somebody looks at the board and says, I can add Nas right now down to three, and mm -hmm. you have a three power Merith, mm -hmm. then they've just put themselves in lethal range. So, For sure. For uh, sure. I, Actually, when we were playing with Flame of Power, um, Folger was telling me that he never uh, goes below five on Ad Nauseam now because somebody galvanic blasted him with metal craft. I've heard that story. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> He's like, yep. So I just never go below five now. Just period. Doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. I, I, and that, that's my personal opinion too. Unless you need to, you don't drop below 10. Mm -hmm. with an ad nause and that's just because i like playing things really safe mm -hmm. uh and my meta is a little more creature heavy than normal when it comes to to cedh so yeah uh but, but uh, current meta, like when you were mentioning red elemental blast and pyroblast is you know the fact that we're shifting to an onboard presence means that moral spells like that mm -hmm. being able to destroy an onboard threat as opposed to just counter a counter spell yes means that those are so much more valuable than they yes used to being be. able to take out a cannon or a thrasios that mm -hmm. somebody is threatening to win with is the best way to do it or i i've seen blowouts happen because somebody has used a pyroblast to counter a copy of a dramatic reversal cast off of an isochron scepter Yep. And that that kind of interaction is essential to have, especially at one mana. Because we aren't playing blue, our our interaction is limited to Pyroblast, Red Elemental Blast, and Source of Plowshares. Yeah, or I mean, I guess you could dig a little deeper and go with Guttural Response. You could go with, uh, you know, the green protect your own stuff kind of thing, like yeah. Veil of Summer and, uh, you know, the Autumn's other Autumn's Veil. Autumn's Veil, yeah. Mm -hmm. And if, if you're worried about other people playing the board wipes and the pyroclasms or the, uh, fire covenants, then there's things like heroic intervention mm -hmm. that you can play too. That'll just say, okay, you'll affect everybody but me right yep. now. Thanks for paying all of that life into fire covenant or into a, well, toxic deluge won't do anything in that instance. But, uh, that's why we might want to play something like a Teferi's intervention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Because we're going to want a board presence and we're going to want nobody else to have a board presence. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there are a few hate bears too that, uh, you know, things like alms collector and stuff like that, you generally don't have to worry so much about, um, you know, those two and three mana board wipes. Mm -hmm. They obviously are not immune to things like fire covenant. They're not immune to things like these, uh, like toxic deluge or any of the X, anything where it's variable. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, you do tend to get a little bit of a bigger booty when you're talking about white hate bears. Yeah. Yeah. You, you get that three toughness, uh, or sometimes higher and you get, uh, you get some evasion on your creatures too, on the hushwing griffs, on the, um, the even mind sensors, uh, mm -hmm. some of the, the flyers that we're going to want to include too. Those are ones that can get in for chip damage. And those are mm -hmm. typically best friends with a Timna because they get in and they draw cards. Yeah. And I mean, if you're, if you're talking about a deck that has an ACMC of 1.2, right? A damage is a card when yeah. we're talking about ad nauseum, right? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. Fantastic. Uh, so it, it, again, it, it sounds like we've got a great shell here. We'll put together a list and at the end of the show, we'll show everybody the list. But Jim, I really wanted to thank you again for coming out and I wanted to thank you for your time. Fantastic conversation. Uh, love picking your brain. Uh, why, why don't you remind everybody where they can find you and where they can find Spike Peters content? Yeah, I'm Jim. Uh, we, we all kind of share our social media accounts, but you can find us on just about any social media platform as, uh, at the Spike Feeders. Um, I, uh, if you're interacting with us on social media, I control our Twitter and our Facebook and I believe that's it. And Maddie controls our Instagram because I'm an old man and I don't know how to use Insta. So. Uh, yeah, if you're messaging us on any of those platforms, just be aware of who you're talking to. Uh, but invariably, it'll be me on Twitter because that's where I spend most of my time. Uh, you can also reach us at spikefeeders.com. You can hop in the Spike Colony Discord. Um, there's a whole bunch of ways to get a hold of us. Fantastic. Uh, and I recommend everybody check out the gameplay on the channel. Uh, if you typically don't watch the higher power level gameplay, 
the spike feeders are a great intro to what this can be and to how your groups or your decks can step up their power level without going full CDH, full competitive, full cutthroat. But keep in mind that this format is always about playing to your playgroup, having a conversation with everybody about the power level at your table, and keeping in mind that there is no right or wrong way to play EDH. This is a format for everybody. For sure. Yeah. I mean, the right way to play it is the way that you enjoy it with your friends, you know? Fantastic. Well, Jim, thank you again. Really do appreciate you coming out. Hopefully we'll hear from you again soon. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Thanks for having me. Great. So here's the list that Jim and I put together around Marath, the Will of the Wild. This is an unconventional Naya red, green, white list that you don't see often in CEDH. A lot of the tools in our toolbox are hate bears. Additionally, we've got some good interaction and for red, white, and green, quite a bit of draw filtering and draw selection. Our game plan here is to hold off the Spellslinger style decks in order to get out ahead, start ramping, and with enough mana and enough draw fixing, really control the board. I'm really eager to see how this one plays out and hope all of you give this one a shot too. Don't count it out just because it doesn't include blue or black. I want to again thank Jim for coming out and spending some time with us. It was a fantastic conversation and great to see some real insights into our format. And we came up with a great brew as well. I really look forward to seeing what we can do with it. Thanks again, Jim, and thank you all for watching. Until next time, good luck and have fun.